So a lot of this show has been about people's religious trauma, the reasons for leaving the church and the psychological self-work that goes into recovering from those experiences. We spent a lot of time pointing out flaws we found in religious reasoning or hearing stories of churches handling people's situations very poorly, sort of stepping back and saying, hey, it's okay to be angry and it's okay to be confused or sad about those experiences and it's definitely okay not to believe. But there's this whole other side to leaving religion that we haven't talked too much about yet. Often when people leave church or religion, they aren't just leaving the beliefs in the building. They're leaving a community. They're leaving close friends and loved ones, sometimes family. For many people, church is where they spent a lot of their spare time. It was their main social activity. So what do you do when you just sort of leave? Further, when you leave church, there's all this work to do to figure out what you actually do believe now. What are your morals based on now? What gives you motivation to be proactive, to follow your dreams, or pursue your passions now that God no longer dictates your purpose in life? Today we're going to talk to our friend James. James has never considered himself a religious person, but technically he's a clergyman at a local congregation. And a large part of what he does is try to help guide people to find their own answers to life's big questions and help them find a workable system of personal ethics. I think a lot of our listeners, and certainly Brady and I, often ask the question, so now that I know that I don't do religion anymore, what do I do? In this episode, we're going to pick James' brain a little bit and hopefully find some direction. I'm Chuck Parson. You're listening to The Life After. Hey, Brady. Hey, Chuck. How are you doing? I feel like we've done this before. <laughs> I know, right? Hey, I wanted to talk to you about something before we start with our guest, which we have an amazing guest today. Who's yeah, like, this is going to be... I'm excited about And this guys, episode. he's British, so he's going to have an accent. Oh, yeah. What? what? That's like our big, biggest commercial, like the biggest thing that we can market right now right, is right. our ne- guest's accent. On the next Life After. I'm just kidding. He's amazing, very well-educated from Great Britain, uh, has his doctorate in Harvard, from Harvard. And a good friend of mine. Oh. Yeah. Fancy, fancy. But before we get him on, I want to talk to you about something. I miss knowing the words to things. Have you ever done this? I don't know what you mean by that, Brady. What I mean by that is like whenever we were Christians, we had our songs. We'd be able to go in every single week and we're able to sing these songs with all these people. And we had like this unified mind almost. Right. uh, Towards one thing. And I feel like since I've left the faith... Um, I have not really been able to find that completely, knowing that that's not the tell-all most in, important experience of all time. Right, but right. But that it is something that I, I honestly... It's miss. really cool. It is. It's cool, and, and it's, uh, yeah, it's corporate. It's, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, I keep using church words, but it's like congregational. It's, you <laughs> yes, know, it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a gathering of humans, which is what we do. Mm-hmm. We are tribal beings. We like to be in in communities and places together and have things in common. So, and I think for me, it also ties into something I talked to Jamie about in that episode. One thing that I've 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 really struggled with is not being the expert of anything anymore. Of not knowing. Uh, I don't have all my theology. You know, I used to know theology so well. I had that all those ducks in a row. You knew it kind of Bible okay. Well. You were a Calvinist after all. <laughs> okay, I knew the theology that I. <laughs> Let me reward this for Chuck. Uh, so I, I was, I was kind of like in in my life or whatever. I was able to excel in certain things uh, very, very passionately, and it was very like sharp and focused. But I think that ever since I left Christianity um, and restarted, it's like I, I was no longer really far down any road anymore. Mm-hmm. It was like I was starting off on a whole lot of roads all at the same time and starting over again. Right. So um, it, it kind of reminded me of like the internet. Whenever you have too many things going at once and it like slows down but like, right. you have well, all like these back different tabs the day, yeah back when that was yeah <laughs> back whenever we didn't have like dsl or yeah. or whatever and so um so you know, if we have too many tabs open if we have too many things in it and they're all trying to load at the same time it takes very quick you know very slowly right. but eventually they're all going to get there right and so it's like i i miss knowing the words to things you yeah. know i miss being the expert at, at, at these things and really sure, having sure. them as part of yeah. my culture but also i recognize that if i continue down this path that I'm going as slow as it may be that eventually all of those tabs are going to load and I may not know the words to a song, but I can drop an album. Right. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> right. Like yeah, yeah. that I can finally you're, catch up. 
you're honing a number instead of so so theology was a single word for, or a single road for you excuse me this is the your life now is you're learning all kinds of skills you're 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 pursuing all kinds of endeavors and like how not to be racist how not to be right like, like transphobic being yeah. okay with being gay right um listening to my body and actually right. listening to instincts you know like learning all these things. learning music that isn't worship songs yes thank you for helping me on that by the way yeah yeah yeah, yeah you're one of the reasons i like childish gambino now hey, hey. i'm a fan yeah me cool. too me too yeah, but, but also like how to be a dad, how to have new morality, you know, like right. all these different things all at once. Um, yeah, how to I, be out. It was just like a you lot know, in, a, in a different way. Sorry, no, you're fine. It was okay. just a lot of things all at once. Yeah, right. In a, in a different way, I think my my leaving the faith was a um, it was sort of like I don't know how to put it. It ex- it accelerated actually for me. It accelerated a lot of learning processes for me because I was always trying to. F- figure out how God fit into everything that I was doing. Yes. Right? Yes. So I was like, uh, if I was, you know, like a lot of the furniture in my house I built, right. Uh, if I was like, he's like looking around like, which ones? <laughs> <laughs> I had no clue you made furniture. Yeah. Yeah. I've made some furniture. Oh my um, God. Okay. Yeah. That bookshelf. I made the bookshelf. No um, way. That was the one thing in your room that I was like, if he made that, I'm going to be super impressed. <laughs> We'll post a picture to the Facebook page. <laughs> that is so um, cool. So yeah, no. So like I, you know, I, I do like woodwork stuff, but it's like, well, how does this? How does my skill in woodwork fit into God's plan? You know, or if I was making music, it was like, how do I write music that you know glorifies God or like delivers right, yeah. a message or something like that? Or you know, if I'm like, uh, oh, I, I'm really good at fixing cars. I can fix almost anything on a car. Um, d- you know, who, who do I need to help? Like how, what kind of ministry do I need to start to like help people get their cars going? In? You know, like that. And it's just like, ah, you make everything so complicated because everything has to have like a purpose, you know? Yes. It's just like, no, it doesn't have to have a purpose. I can just know how to fix cars. You know, the last time I worked on a car, it's been like three years since I worked on a car because I can afford not to now and I don't <laughs> care anymore and I can focus on other stuff and I make a lot more music because I'm not always trying to cram, you know, some message into it and, and it's better. It's a lot better music. Now, that's so, that's how I am with you writing. Know? You yeah. know, I wrote my Christian novel and I couldn't write for three or four years because I, I had always everything that I wrote up to that point was like a Christian allegory or somehow mm-hmm. I had the plan of salvation, all these different things. And so now after I left all that, I'm like, oh, how do I do this? Like, what are these letters that I'm trying right. to yeah, you know, yeah. put together? It's, there's a rebuilding period for sure. Um, but what are some of the things from like your Christian past? Do you, do you really miss? Cause I know that you played a lot of like worship music. I was music. a worship leader for years and that years. Was a phrase I could use. pick up a guitar okay. right now and play here I am to worship. Well, it's basically the same <laughs> chord progression as any other song, isn't it? Well, Just yeah, like yeah, yeah. My friend, CG uh, or... my friend said one time, uh, if you don't know here I am to worship, you're not a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what song yeah, I miss the most is days of Elijah. I don't like, know that song, and I'm I'm glad I won't sing it for you. But there was just something about it of like singing it with a big congregation, a big group of people, yeah, yeah, yeah. would just really get my my heart pumping and my oh, soul turning. You know, and that's honestly, yeah. Leading corporate worship was uh, it was it was a it was a very human thing. You know, it's mm-hmm. like it's all like in it, at this point in my life, I would look back and say, oh, it's all sort of based on this like phony set of presuppositions, but. Uh, the act of like a bunch of people getting together and singing songs that they like have an emotional connection to and being able to lead like for me personally being able to like get up on stage and like lead people in this emotional experience was like pretty meaningful it's pretty cool you know Mm -hmm. Um, it had a lot it had a lot to it there was a lot that went there was a lot of uh, realness I guess that went into it there's a lot of fakeness that goes into it too but there's something like it was always just me when I did it. It was just me with an acoustic guitar for the most part. So it wasn't like it wasn't a lot of flash and dazzle and like smoke and lights and stuff like it. Like there are in some churches. It was just like, hey, I have a microphone and a guitar and like let's sing some songs together. And it was all it was, it was very meaningful, you know. So I miss that. Yeah, definitely. So on I some think level. a thing that I'm having to learn is to not try to cre- recreate that. You know, that my goal doesn't need mm-hmm. to be to find my secular or, you know, atheist or agnostic or however you all identify, I identify as atheist, but I don't need to find my version of that within my community mm-hmm. of where I'm going to be with a big group of people singing atheist songs um, and where we all know the words and we all have our hands raised and, you know, having that experience. What I need to do is find what 
I get that same sort of joy out of. And that's what I'm doing right now, like this yeah, podcast yeah, and absolutely. Um, interacting with our listeners. And inter- and so I think that, you know, we it's important to not try to recreate everything that we had before um, in the sense of like a one-to-one comparison of, oh, I used to do this. Now I do something that looks just like it, but the lyrics are different. Yeah, It's more of finding what you find that joy in and that you're going to be able to in- to really like reflect on and benefit from and it may look completely different right yeah yeah yeah. it's uh uh, be creative and uh and figure out what it was about the thing that you miss that was meaningful right Mm -hmm. like break it down to its essence you know what what was it exactly you know what 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 aspects of it were do you think gave it life right and then take that and make something new out of it you know it's amazing. That's one of the reasons I invited our guest on today. Yes. Uh, my friend James. Our he, first clergyman. Yes. On the show. First clergyman. Um, he's uh, going to be one of our first like experts outside of Jamie, like on a one specific topic. But um, I wanted to bring James in today. He is a friend of mine. Um, I will let him speak after we go to commercial. I love doing this where we like hold them hostage, where we talk about them, but they're not allowed to speak yet. Yeah. Let's draw this out as long as we can. I like his shirt. I think his glasses make it, they really say clergy. They do. They do. You all are going to love his accent. We're going to speak to James right after this break. Hey, Chuck, remember tithing? Uh, You mean that thing in the Old Testament where they were supposed to give 10% of their money to the Levites that the modern church used to replace what Jesus taught about Christians giving all their possessions to the poor? Yeah, that. Well, I think I figured out a way to make it cheaper and easier. How's that? Patreon. It's an online crowdfunding tool where people can support the art they like by automatically donating monthly amounts of money. Do we have one for the life after? We do. You can go to patreon.com backslash the life after, or there's a link from our website, thelifeafter.org, under the website menu. I'll chuck it out. I'm not saying that. You have to say chuck it out. (laughs) Welcome to the show, James. How are you? I am great. I'm so excited to be here. How would you like us to address you today? Uh, Dr. James Croft? I would prefer just James. I find it so pretentious when people... (laughs) So Dr. James. (laughs) It's funny you should do that because basically all my friends do that. I Uh, keep telling them not to call me Dr. Croft and they do it all the damn time. But it's like so Tomb Raider-y. You yes. know, yeah, I, yeah, can't, I, like I can't, I can't help yeah. it. James, how did she was meet? an archaeologist and a discoverer of amazing historical artifacts and a total badass. And I am actually all of those things. So, so it's basically, yeah, it's a one to one comparison. Yeah. Do you wield <laughs> pistols? Dual pistols. Dual, dual pistols. <laughs> and I look stunning in hot pants. You should see me in brown hot pants and a, a kind of forest green. Well, and, and you well, haven't been posting that to the Facebook. And you page. have been working out a lot, and I've noticed that your packs been. are just very triangular. You know, I, I think <laughs> the fat is just relocating itself in advantageous ways. <laughs> I love it. Um, how did we meet, James? We met on Scruff, I think, on one of the gay hookup apps. I know you want to say dating apps, but that's just a lie. <laughs> they are hookup apps. Although I have had dates. I've had them. dates and I found friends, obviously friends. Um, yes. It wasn't Grinder. It was definitely Scruff. I'm pretty sure. Okay. I don't get Good. any, this any is, interest on Grinder at all. This is the only way I can make smart friends is through like the intersections of like really bad gay <laughs> dating apps. <laughs> No, and um, and we we've hung out, and then like a gay pride, you had your booth set up for um, the St. Louis Ethical Society. Yes, the Where, Ethical Society of St. Louis. Damn it, I that's always the official that. name. So Everyone it's does the, it. The Ethical Society of St. Louis. The, the Ethical, Ethical Society, Society okay. of St. Louis. Tell me about what that is. The Ethical Society of St. Louis is a congregation, a humanist congregation, where people of all religions and none come together to explore the biggest questions of life: Why are we here? What's going on? How should we treat each other? So in many ways, it is kind of like a church, except that we don't teach any specific religion. We don't have any scripture. We don't have any dogma. We have no requirements on our members to believe any particular thing about God or the afterlife or the supernatural. Rather, we're a congregation based around shared values, the central of which is the equal dignity and worth of all people. Awesome. I love it. And so you identify as a clergyman. I don't love that term. I am a clergy person. I am clergy at the Ethical Society. I am here in the United States on a religious workers visa. 
which is one of the visas they give out specifically to people in ministerial and clergy-like positions. I went through a training process to become what we call a leader at an ethical society, and that's it's not a process of ordination, but it's a process of preparation for a clerical role mm -hmm. in the communities. So I am employed by the ethical society. I serve the congregation in a clerical capacity, so I am clergy. I just, I grew up non-religious. I have never been religious. It still makes me do a double take in my own mind when I think that I am a clergy person, but I am one. I'm just a very weird type of clergy person. So you identify as a religious now. I still think of myself as a non-religious person. It is a complicated question for me because the Ethical Society of St. Louis is a religious congregation. The movement of which it is a part, which is called Ethical Culture, was founded as a religious movement. It was understood as its founder as an evolution of the idea of religion to get beyond the sectarian and divisive nature, he thought, of traditional religions, which separated people out into buckets depending on what they believed about God or what they believed about Jesus. He thought that the primary function of religion was to bring people together in community to discuss ethical questions and how to live. And so he wanted to create a space where people of any religion and none could do that together without being kind of made into these little sectarian groups that explore their own version. Right. And so he created this space for that, and it was understood by him as religious. But he said something early on, which I find very important in my own understanding of what I do, which is ethical culture is religious to those who are religiously minded and merely a philosophy to those who are not. And I take the same approach today. Some of our members consider ethical culture and humanism their religion, and some of our members do not think of it as religious. I think of it as a worldview, a way of looking at life and of approaching life. I don't think of myself as a religious person simply because my background is non-religious. I didn't grow up within a traditional religious home, and I always felt myself outside of religion. I went to a private Christian school, which doesn't mean what it means here in the United States. I was going to say, I forgot that I, I didn't know that about you. Um, I think you have mentioned it like early on in our friendship, and I completely forgot about that. Yeah. I think I just pictured you looking like uh, Harry Potter or something. Like dressed as him, going to school each day. <laughs> that is exactly right. We wore exactly those uniforms, except without the robes on top. Sadly, oh, uh, well, I no, had that was the, the best part. That's like the best part. Yeah. I know. yeah, but we had the ties. We even had house ties, depending on which house we were in. And you seem like a Ravenclaw. I am a Ravenclaw. <laughs> I am totally a Ravenclaw. I have the robes, Ravenclaw yeah. robes. Good, good, perfect. Yeah, I really was. We had that whole thing. The whole of Harry Potter is genuinely based on British prep schools okay. in Oxford yeah, yeah, and Cambridge. Totally. So I had that experience. So uh, do, you, do, you, do you deliver sermons? What do you call them? Is it a message? I do. I deliver what I think of as a form of sermon. We call our Sunday community meeting platform, and the sermon, in quotes, is the platform address. Okay. But even many of our members probably wouldn't be able to tell you that. They just think of it as the talk. Right, right. It's and the talk part. I think that it plays a very similar role to the sermon in our, we don't call it a service, but equivalent of a service, because it is supposed to be relevant to people's lives, engaging ethically uplifting, intellectually challenging. It is supposed to address big questions about how we live. And I happen to love sermons. I love listening to them. I love them as an art form. I was actually listening to one on the bus over here. A friend of mine was giving a sermon this morning, and I never get to hear my friends give sermons because we're all doing it at the same time, but I often try and listen to them if they're recorded. And I just love that form of speech, which is meant to inspire and motivate life change in mm -hmm. people. I think that's a very important skill. And so I think of my work like that. I've read books on giving good sermons. I listen to podcasts of sermons. Uh -huh. I'm a total sermon nerd. Okay, cool, cool. And 
I really love when that is done well. I think it's a difficult skill. But yeah, a, I do that about once a month. It's a rhetorical skill. It's the ability to make something succinct and, and poignant. and Yes. Yeah. To make complex ideas easy to, easy yes. to, you know, to swallow. So, so in your community, um, you, in, in, in Christian churches, right, it's a, the, sort of the theme is like you start at point A and you, as a human, you want to advance and you want to move and you want to... You're learning from your pastor or from your small groups or from whatever, you know, youth camp or whatever you're participating in. And the goal is like, oh, I can look back through two, three years and see like, I was this person then and I've learned these important, valuable life lessons and I've I've moved forward, right? Is that is that sort of like a, is that a goal or is, that, is that overstating it a little bit? Yeah, sanctification, right? Yeah, I do see that as a goal. I see one of the goals of the Ethical Society as being to improve people, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. I know that I am in need of improvement, that there are times when I don't live up to my highest values and I'm not my best self. I would like to help other people and myself be better today than they were yesterday. And so I do see that as part of our role. I think some of our members might be uncomfortable with that idea because it, mm -hmm. it might sound to them a little bit judgmental. Like Because once you have an idea of better or worse, then... You're kind of setting up something that sounds like a hierarchy. Right. But I think ethical development and education is one of the things that we were established to do, and I take it really seriously. My hope is that people will come on Sunday and attend our programs and deepen their understanding of the complexity of ethical decision-making, be able to reason through ethical challenges they face in their own lives a little better feel more confident in their own values because they've been able to give them deep thought. I guess the difference between what we're doing and what many traditional religious congregations do is that I honestly try never to provide people with an answer to these big questions. I really think of what I'm doing is try and give people tools and frameworks for thinking about the problems so that they can come away from it grapple with more tools to grapple with it than they had before that doesn't mean that i never make judgments about what's right or wrong because sometimes i think you have to do that but sure. i try and not be doctrinaire we think at the ethical society of ethics as a process rather than a product or an outcome and the best thing we can do is help people become better at the process of thinking about right and wrong and mm -hmm. if we can do that we expect that they will make better decisions in their lives right. and they'll feel that so it's not so much uh like uh, oh here are the tenets of our of our, our organization this is what we believe these are our sexual ethics these are our you know this this is how we do alms this is blah 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 it's it's more like let's establish a a, a reasonable means of creating your own morality I think that's a good description. I firstly want to say I love that you used the word alms, which is a word that is <laughs> yeah. underused. I was like, this is going to be a weird one. I <laughs> love that yourself. word. It's, it's very archaic. I like old yeah, yeah. words. That's great. Alms. It's spelled in a delicious way. That's a good, that's a good <laughs> old English word. Um, yeah, exactly. I think that we're really trying to help people think better through the problems that they have instead of giving them a list of here's how you should be in these situations. Now, there are cases where we'll take very clear stances on things. Like you talk about sexual ethics. Well, we are, and striving to become more so, a sex positive, totally LGBTQIA plus affirming community. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to uh, question what we think about that or what we say about that in the sense of, well, maybe we shouldn't be that. That's not, so we're not going to get to a point ever where we're like, oh no, we thought about it a lot and we've rescinded that value. We're going to go back. Some things, we have core values mm -hmm. that our whole community is built around. And one of them is the equal dignity of every person. And some questions just are so close to that core value that it's easy to say what the right position should be on it. Um, I have a question for you, James, because I know that um, a lot of our listeners are probably, this is going to be hard for some of us to regurgitate, to like really take in and understand because um, we have been taught 
as you know, <laughs> that Christianity a lot of times teaches that they're the, the, the creators of ethics, they're the creators of morality. And so it's hard for some of us that we have this idea that now that we've gotten away from Christianity, uh, we're having to recreate our, our morality. And it's hard for us to know like what direction we should go because it's always been black and white fed to us. This is right. This is wrong. Right, right. And don't question it because I am the Lord. Yeah. Um, and, and, and do you have an ethical question Go to the Bible. Yes. Right? Yes. So, so there's no like resources. Like you don't need to. You don't need to read Kant. You know, like you just you like. <laughs> but but the reason you too have this black and white thinking that comes up a lot is for if somebody says, "Hey, I'm a homosexual." Well, they're like, "Well, then is bestiality okay with you?" Then obviously, then then maybe you should be fine with. You know, then it goes yeah, into this, yeah. that it's like this all or nothing thing that that's not at all what is being said. Morality exists outside of. The religion we came from. Can you kind of give us a little bit of guidelines of what would be helpful for us as we rebuild our morality and what's important to us and our ethics? Absolutely. I think you ask a really profound question because there is, I think, a fundamentally different approach to morality and ethics which we promote than which some conservative congregations promote. We we do not believe that there is any ultimate answer to the big ethical questions that face all of us as we move mm -hmm. through life. We recognize that ethics is a question of how to act well that comes up whenever people are in community with each other and take actions which affect other people. So ethical questions exist whenever there are groups of people doing things that affect each other. And ethics has existed since the beginning of human communities, at least mm -hmm. ethical questions have, and responses to those questions have, of course, of course, preceded any particular religious response to that question. There are tons of literal treatises on ethics which predate Christianity by quite a long time. In fact, one of the things which led the founder of the ethical culture movement to become more skeptical of his own Jewish background and want to reach out to a more universal way of thinking about ethics, which could include all people regardless of their religious views, was reading ancient writings on ethics that uh -huh. predated the Jewish tradition, right, even the right, Jewish right. tradition, which itself predates the Christian tradition. And so people have been doing ethics and thinking about ethics for a long time. And we encourage people not to think of ethics as a process of finding the correct answer from the right teacher or the right book. Okay, yeah, we yeah. don't think that there's ultimate answers to be found in any scripture or because some really smart person thousands of years ago said what they supposed to have said on the question. Mm -hmm. Rather, we say what ultimately will benefit the people who will be affected by this decision the most. And then you have to reason it out. And it's not always very easy to do. Like We have a tolerance at the Ethical Society, I think, for complexity and the fact that many questions are actually really very difficult. And ultimately, people of goodwill can come to different answers to an ethical question, even if they're working with the same information and have the same basic values, that we might not always agree on profound ethical questions, even if we basically agree on some fundamental ideas about how people should be treated. And so, we are kind of open to a level of ethical complexity and fuzziness that I think is often uncomfortable f for people who, whose experience of ethical reasoning is more about the is more about these are the list of the approved answers to this question. We mm -hmm. reject that way of thinking entirely, and in fact, we kind of teach the opposite of it. We teach something the inverse of that. In our Sunday Ethical Education for Kids program, which is our kids program that runs right from kindergarten through 12th grade, <laughs> right? That is what Americans call it, right? Yeah, yeah. K, K, through, 12. K through 12. We teach young people that they have the right to question what they're taught by adults, to make their own decisions, that they have a responsibility to act ethically, but that they have to decide what that means for themselves. And one of the things that we do in our community, which is one of my favorite things, is we have a two-year coming-of-age program, which is sort of a equivalent to a confirmation program okay. or something like that, in which 
our young people do a process of essentially ethical discernment where they decide what is most important to them and the issues that want mm-hmm. to guide their life and what where they want to focus their efforts. And then at the end, they give a talk to the community on Sunday morning. Each of them who's graduating gives a talk in which they explain their own values and how they got to that place and something that's important to them. And we do that awesome. because really we cool, want to focus on young people's agency and their ability to make decisions for themselves right. about... That blew me away. Um, when I visited you, you know, there was, a, there was a girl, how old was she? Probably 11 yeah. or something, who kind of like said what their mission statement was for this, this organization he's talking about with the kids. And I, I'm sitting there by myself and I'm about to cry. Um, right. like I, cause, because it, it was so moving and touching because I was thinking to myself, when I, I was her age... I was told if I don't follow these rules, I'd be burning in hell. Like that was this sort of indoctrination yeah, yeah, that I yeah. had as a kid. Yes, they taught me to do to be nice to others and everything like that. And what your came out well. Your, what your congregation would have encouraged was you to get up there and and regurgitate dogma, it, recite scripture, yes, say something that is like reinforce everything that ever all of us already know. Right. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Which is not what you're talking about. You're no. talking about doing something totally. We're talking about the inverse of that. Yeah. We're, she I, talked about empathy, and that word came out of her mouth, and I was just like, <laughs> "Oh my god!" Like I, I wanted those resources as a kid. Uh, we do need to take a really quick break. Uh, when we get back, I want to discuss a little bit more of this project or this program, excuse me. Um, but I also want to talk about as you as a clergyman, you've been with that phrase or with that title, you've been put on some very interesting panels and discussions. Um, and you've met some very interesting people, um, from our world. So I want to talk about some of your experiences with that. Uh, when we get back, uh, we'll be back right after this. The Life After Facebook page is a great way to get in touch with other religion survivors. Also, we like to post interesting articles on there. And it's a good way to get a hold of us. And you won't need a concordance to find us. (laughs) We We have a link to the Facebook page on our website, thelifeafter.org. Or search The Life After on Facebook. Finally, you could just go to our URL, facebook.com slash thelifeafterorg. Everybody, welcome back. Hey, uh, so James, when I was there and the the girl was giving her her um, she's going over the core values. The correct? core values, yes. Can you recite any of those for us? Like, do you remember any of them? Oh no! And can you please, like, use a little British kid voice? I was hoping <laughs> that you weren't going to ask me because I can never remember <laughs> okay, every okay. single one. Give, give, give me some generalizations. Then. Every person is important and unique. <laughs> Every person deserves to be treated fairly and kindly. I can learn from everyone. I am part of the earth. I cherish it and all the life upon it. I am free to question. I am free to choose what I believe. I am part of the world community. And uh, I am something about responsibility. And then the last one is I strive to live my values. I I remember the responsibility one because she she said that she would take responsibility that she will take responsibility for her actions. I don't know if that's exactly exactly just of it. I take responsibility for yeah. I accept responsibility for something. I I forget that I can never recite them all. But, but I, that's I most felt of them. when she started talking about I get to choose or I, I can question or I get to choose what my beliefs are, I, I, I felt myself like starting to well up. And then whenever she talked about taking responsibility for the, the consequences of, of her actions and beliefs, yeah. I think that was not, I think, she, did she say in beliefs? There's something in there that um, made it sound like I'm not just going to teach all of this stuff and, you know, teach like harmful things and walk away from it. Like I'm going to take responsibility. Yes. That's how I interpret it I myself. Expe- I accept responsibility for my choices and actions is that one. And I love that one because I think sometimes humanism, which is the life stance we promote at the Ethical Society of St. Louis, which I like to describe as having three main components, compassion, the belief in the equal dignity and worth of all people, reason, which is our capability as human beings to understand the world through our own unaided intellect, and hope, the belief in our capacity to change the world for the better by working together. That's uh, as opposed to doctrines of salvation that says we need help from outside. We say, no, if the the world is going to be made better, it's going to be through the efforts of human beings working together. Which is like such a massive, important 
thing that I had to adopt when I left the faith. It's that's so big. It yeah. encompasses a lot. Yes. Of it, it reshaped my worldview in so many ways. I I can't even like start to talk about it, but I can't underemphasize how important that difference is. Right. Well, and it's also the theme song to Arthur, the Aardvark. <laughs> I actually, funny Working you should together, say that. It's the place it's to start. start. Yeah. Uh, yeah, believe in yourself. It's the place to yes. start. And funny you should say that because one of the teachers at my at my uh, Presbyterian high school, well, I was in a meeting once and he was like, you know, I don't know. Arthur has that really dangerous message <laughs> in, the, in the intro. I'm not even shitting you like this. Yeah, he was I'm like so legitimately concerned that believing in yourself is a really toxic teaching. Well, there is a psalm, isn't there? Put not your trust in men, yes. and then you can find no hope. Right, right, that, I remember hearing that. I actually really enjoy churches and congregational settings. I like going to them. I like the experience of them. I'm a very weird sort of atheist. I have always enjoyed going to church. I was a choir boy all the way through school, and we sang in the chapel every month. And I really liked it, actually. I didn't go back on the other Sundays because I didn't believe in any of it, but I actually liked the experience of being with other people in a time set aside for what felt like important questions about how to live. And I remember hearing that psalm being sung once when I visited a church on Harvard's campus, and I was so mad because I was like, this is the opposite of what I believe. The only hope for salvation lies in humankind. I believe in self-salvation. And so much of our culture teaches the opposite, that we need to be saved by the superhero or the God or the savior. And it's like, no, there aren't any saviors. It has to be us. Mm -hmm. And when we recognize that, we can start to take responsibility for our own choices and actions. Right. And that's why I think that's such an important part of our core values that we teach our children. And why, as, as I was saying, Humanism is often portrayed as this sort of, you can do whatever you want, it doesn't matter, mm -hmm. there are no boundaries, mm -hmm. just kind of be nice to people. And I hate that portrayal because I see it as a rigorous process of determining one's own values and trying to hold oneself and one's community up to those high standards all the time and accepting that if you fail, that is on you and you have to do something to get over that and get better. Not that you're going to go to hell if you don't, but that it's simply important to be the best version of yourself you could possibly be mm -hmm. yep. instead of not such a good version of yourself. And so I don't, yeah, I like the idea that we have in those core values, the accepting responsibility for our own choices and actions. That's beautiful. And you know, on the other side of that, I would say that was, that was a good, James did a little flair there. He had a little... And cool. Flair was beautiful. Yeah, it was good. It was a really good one. Um, on the on the other side of that, like for me, I hear uh, uh, the the idea that we are like humankind is is responsible for our own salvation. Um, that that sort of contradicts the the need for a savior implies that there is something inherently wrong with us, right? Um, and so that that is this, like, I keep trying to find ways to explain to Christians this pervasive shame that exists in religious culture, mm -hmm. um, where you need a savior, so you are begging God to fix you, right? Whereas when, if the humanist approach is like, you are fine, you need you can improve. You, you you are capable of improving on your own. But there's nothing inherently wrong with you. There's yes. no there's no human brokenness. Your body is not bad. Your spirit is not good. You just are. And you can make choices and you take responsibility for them. And you you personally get to make them. It's not some mechanism in you. It's not sinfulness. It's not original sin. It's not the Holy Spirit. If it's good, it's not the Holy Spirit. If it's bad, it's not the sin nature. It's just you being a human that exists, and that's fine. Yes. I and think that is so big. Huge. I think that is a beautiful way of expressing it. And I detest the narrative of brokenness. That's one of the tropes of Christianity and some other faiths that I find most troubling, because I think it does lead to a lot of shame. I think it 
misrepresents our position vis-a-vis the universe. I think it's just simply an an inaccurate portrayal of what sort of creature that we are. Even progressive theologians and Christian thinkers, I remember I was reading one of the books by Nadia Boltz-Weber, who is a Mm -hmm. Lutheran, a progressive Lutheran, an an impressive figure and someone who I like as a Christian thinker. But a lot of her theological and ethical thinking seems to rely on this idea of inherent human brokenness Mm -hmm. and the need to overcome and and fulfill oneself by taking into oneself something that is not already there. And that really bothers me. I like to say, because sometimes humanism, again, is caricatured as thinking is people are inherently good. You know, they're just good. And if you take away the barriers, they'll be fine. And I don't believe that. I think that I like to say people are not inherently good or inherently evil. We're inherently animals. Mm -hmm. We are evolved animals. And we have instincts that draw us in different directions and the capacity to rationally reflect upon our instincts and make decisions that take them into account, that control them in particular ways, that lead us in particular directions. And for me, we should just, as you put it, recognize that we we just exist. Our simple existence and our nature has no moral valence to it. It's Mm. not good. It's not bad. We're just part of a natural world like a bear is. I don't know why bears came to mind. (laughs) (laughs) Because we met on Scruff, (laughs) Brady. But but yeah, we're just part of the natural world with the capacity to reflect on our actions and to take responsibility for our own choices. I think that's kind of like our new type of evolution, though. Like Our ability to evolve now is to improve our societies, not to grow extra thumbs on you know by our pinkies it's it's more although of a, i'm banking on that one <laughs> but it, it's kind of that now we have the ability to really focus in and be very empathetic and understanding of what our society should be and how mm-hmm. it should function how it should treat each other so that we can continue to go forward um chuck i think it was interesting too earlier you talked about the core parts that really stuck out to you the one that stuck out to me a lot was was reasoning that we should Mm -hmm. listen to reasoning and have a voice of science because the communities that we came from, the people that we put on the biggest pedestals are the ones that were able to believe the most outrageous things. Um, It felt like that, that had no, I can, yeah. Okay. No scientific proof or, or or showing is whoever had the biggest faith of like whoever had the, the biggest ability to ignore reasoning Uh were the ones that we, put up right, right, right. um and yeah. also the core values james and i hope this is not too personal for me to ask you but you have like a personal motto like a personal saying that you have um that is kind of like how you would melt down your um your morality and i think you posted on facebook once or something and it stuck with me can you tell us what that is i could if i knew what you were referring to <laughs> one, one world <laughs> oh, one yes. life why am I reciting this? I, how do I say it? What is it? It's yes, I do. I remember that it is on my Facebook profile. It's one world, one life, one hope, and what I, that comes from a kind of little tiny little poem, which I wrote once for one of my talks, which was it's not. I feel like so much weight is being put on it, and I feel like it's just a little I silly love thing it. I came up with. It means a lot to me. We'll so what what I said in, originally was. Our only life is this life. Our only world is this world. Our only hope is each other. Mm. And that Mm -hmm. is enough. Mm. And that was my own personal distillation of humanism and what it means to me. So that's why it says on my Facebook, one life, one world, one hope, humanism. And I I don't want to overstress, like humanism is a small movement in the United States and in the world. There are really a tiny minority of people who call themselves humanists explicitly. So I'm not going to say humanists are going to save the world. But I do believe that the shift in culture towards a more humanistic value set, towards a way of thinking which prioritizes the welfare of people over tradition, Mm -hmm. over religious teachings, specific religious teachings, over political expediency, over what powerful people or corporations want, That shift in ethical thinking has been profoundly impactful on the way we think as a world culture about human beings. Like humanists, 
were involved in the drafting of the first UN Declaration of Human Rights. Mm -hmm. Our Humanist Manifesto, the first one published in the, I want to say the 30s, and then again in the 70s, and again in 2000 and whatever, really laid out a pathway for coming up with a global ethic which prioritized human welfare over any other concerns. Mm. And so I think that in terms of shifting the ethical discourse, we have had a significant impact because we have consistently said for a long time, really the only thing that matters is what effect does this have on people? It doesn't matter what your culture says is good or bad or what your religion says is good or bad or what you think God says is good or bad. The way we should judge the ethics of something is how does it affect people? And I'm going to kind of blow our own trumpet, as it were, a little bit and say that historically, that way of thinking has served humanists very, very well. Mm -hmm. Our communities, ethical culture communities, particularly ethical societies around the country, have been on the forefront of many civil rights struggles. The civil rights struggle uh, for African Americans, so uh, ethical culturists and ethical societies were right at the forefront of that for gay rights and the rights of LGBTQ people more generally. We're right on the forefront of that. I remember taking a class on the history of American unbelief at Harvard Divinity School. Mm. And one of my classmates who was a Christian was reading all these texts about humanism and about the history of humanism in the United States. And in one class, he said, it seems to me that if you want to know what progressive people will believe 40 years from now, look at what humanists are saying today. Wow. And very often that is the case because we are able to say, wait a minute, we have historically taught this. This isn't serving people. We need to change what we teach. And one of my favorite, just very quickly, my favorite examples of this comes from close to the beginning of the whole ethical culture movement when the founder of ethical societies himself was still alive. And he was enraged that the Chicago Ethical Society had decided to have a talk one Sunday morning on divorce. And he <laughs> had this really old-fashioned view about the central importance of the family. Uh -huh. And he wrote to them and said, the only issue an ethical society cannot discuss is divorce, because it is wrong, wrong, wrong. Huh. And they wrote back to him, the founder of the whole movement, and basically said, fuck off. <laughs> we are going to talk about what we like. And it's important to discuss how social attitudes are changing and how, in some cases, of course, a divorce is the best thing that can possibly happen. And the ability to be self-critical and reflective about our own values, the explicit acknowledgement that nothing we say is gospel truth right. is a very important part of right. our tradition. Yeah. And I think it served us well over many decades. Um, so I hear a lot of the things that you're saying are definitely in huge conflict of what I was brought up with. And uh, when we get back after this break, I want to hear more about this conflict of how, um, I don't want to say how you've butted heads, because I don't think that's the type of person that you are, but how some sometimes of the, the ideology that you're teaching has conflicted with the ideology, ideology of other clergymen. Uh, we'll talk about that right when we get back from this break. What is that? I'm calling it a... Grrr. It's a new letter I've been working on. You're right, Chuck. We've always had 26, but I think we could really benefit from having 27. Oh, Brady, I asked you to make a newsletter, not a new letter. Oh. Like we could put a link on our website and have listeners sign up to receive an email newsletter whenever we have updates? Exactly like that. Yeah, okay, I, I could get that ready by the time we release this. Sounds great. Sign up for the newsletter at thelifeafter.org. Welcome back, everybody. So, James, uh, right before the break, uh, you, you said a phrase that um, reminded me of a conversation I was having with a friend the other day. Uh, you said, nothing that we say is gospel truth, right? Um, what, was, what stood out to me, not only, you know, uh, as a, as a, in, in Christian communities, what the, the pastor or the, or the Bible or, or whoever is speaking is saying is supposed to be gospel truth, right? It's supposed to be literal gospel truth in that, you know, you just ganked that phrase from the <laughs> totally Bible, but, from, yeah. but also like it is, it is true. It is a, it is a statement that stands the test of time that cannot be challenged. And if, it, if you contradict it, you are probably wrong is how you should approach that. And if you, if you, contradicted and you want to be right you have to 
you have to do exegesis and all of these like you know breakdowns of the scriptures to figure out whether or not what you're saying is right um and there's this it, it the conversation i was having with my friend the other day was about how there are these moments where when you're a christian your worldview gets challenged by somebody somebody says something that is that is you hear it and you realize what they're saying is accurate and it uh, flies in the face of of whatever belief that they're they're challenging, and then you have to go through this process, right? Of so you have to talk to your pastor about it, and you have to process it, and you have to go to, go to the Bible. You it's have like to a read Rube the Goldberg Bible. machine. <laughs> right. It's like yeah, it is. You yeah. have to yeah. It's this process. You have to um, you have to you know um, pray about it a lot or whatever. Mm-hmm. And you sort of have this feeling in the pit of your stomach. I can't remember which philosopher it was. Somebody called it a state of doubt. It's like people don't like being cast into a state of doubt that makes them very uncomfortable. It's an uneasiness. They you're believe trying to it out. one yeah. thing wholeheartedly, and that is that is fact, right? But something else came along that challenged it, and now they have to go through this process. And it's so slow, and it's so, uh, it's so uh, inefficient, and it doesn't give you room to to learn new things, right? And what you're saying, the, the humanist view is, well, if nothing that we say is gospel truth, if there are no, if we could, like anything that we say could be wrong, and we accept that, right? There's this, that is such a big difference. If somebody c- comes up to me and challenges my view of a given thing, I can take what they say. I can say, man, that is accurate, and I need to rethink the way that I think about this. And it's mm. just, it's an internal dialogue. And it's not insanely uncomfortable because it doesn't dis, it doesn't shake the bedrock of my entire worldview because I don't have this brick bedrock that's the Bible that's supposed to be 100% accurate. And if you start plucking away pieces, it starts to chip away at the whole thing. It's just, oh, okay, that's different. I hadn't thought of it that way. Let me rethink it. And that is huge. That is so relieving. And it's also important to the kind of evolution that, that, you, that Brady was talking about earlier, where we adopt new ideas and we grow and we change and, and, uh, and we go that way. And I just monologued for a long time. But it feels that so much of what our community was before was just built on, well, we have these black and white viewpoints in common. But what you're telling me is that your community is not built on these black and white dogmatic things. What does your community look like? And what is some of your advice for our listeners that are trying to now create a new community? Um, what would you say to them? That's a great question. Thank you. I just want to first respond and say what, what you described, Chuck, would be the ideal of a humanist response to receiving information that challenges your worldview. We would love everyone to get to that point, I would love to get to that point right, myself. Right, of In reality, everyone's a human being. Yes. And we actually talk explicitly about how to change your mind and how to change other people's mind because we recognize that everyone has a worldview. Everyone, I don't mean that in the way the Christian apologists often use it to say, you know, even atheists believe in a kind of God. It's like, no. It's just, but everyone does have things that they believe which are very difficult for them to have challenge. Personal dogmas, in a way. Personal dogmas, but also there are social cultural dogmas. So we've been having long discussions in our community over the past three years since the murder of Michael Brown about white privilege. And people, white people who are challenged about white privilege are often very defensive and find it difficult to accept information that contradicts their own view of the world and themselves. And that can be true whether you are religious or not, whether you are in a liberal religious community mm-hmm. or a conservative mm-hmm. community or a humanist community. Yeah. And so dogmatic thinking and uh, defensiveness around new information that challenges one's worldview is a universal human experience. What I think we try and do is firstly explicitly recognize that and teach our people about that so that they can at least have the experience, oh, I'm being defensive in mm-hmm. response to this information, uh, how do I take a step, given that I now recognize that I'm being defensive? Because one of the things I believe in is that even if we can't change our instinctive reactions to things, if we understand what the reactions are and that they're common human reactions, we can 
respond to them differently. Mm -hmm. So we have a reaction and we can recognize it as a particular type of reaction and then we have a different sort of response. And secondly, we do try and teach people how to be more open-minded. Like I think I gave a talk, I can't remember all the talks I've given over the past three years, but I think I gave a talk about how to change our own mind and how to become, how to train ourselves to become a little bit more open-minded. But I don't want to paint the picture like everyone at the Ethical Society has always been like, oh, wow, that's a great, excellent point. I will totally turn on a dime and think what you think. Now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Another important thing is, which you nailed perfectly, is that our source of authority is different. We mm. never, it would never be acceptable within our space. I'm not saying we would kick you out, but it would just not be respected to say, oh, but I looked in the Bible and it said this. So that's the answer to the question. We just be like, what, so what? Why should we take what it says in the Bible to be true? Right. Our ultimate source of authority is evidence and reasons. Mm -hmm. So if someone can give us good evidence and good reasons that our viewpoint is mistaken, then hopefully we will change our mind. Mm -hmm. And we had an example of this not too long ago, to get back to your question about community, Brady. Just give an example of how it works. We had a talk by a quite well-known speaker about, it was about essentially um, the sexual assault registry. What's it called? The sexual predator registry yeah, or whatever, yeah, yeah. Or sure whatever exactly it is. Exact name and it. she was arguing in a way that I think was quite uncomfortable for some of our members that basically it does more harm than good and we should get rid of it. But she had a lot of evidence to support her view uh, for instance, it's possible to get on the sex offender registry for all sorts of things that have nothing to do with an actual with public sexual offense. Urination. Uh, yeah. pu public urination and um, streaking at a football game, things right. like that can get you on the sex offender registry for life. And she was giving examples of these cases and saying, well, if that's the case, then just knowing someone is on it doesn't tell you whether they're a danger to your child. So it's totally useless to have it. And it ferments this kind of moral panic where everyone's always scared about who might be next door. And that, that actually isn't good for children. It restricts their ability to go out and play and cycle their bikes around at night and do the things that mm -hmm. everyone was doing in mm -hmm. the 80s in Stranger Things, you know, having an adventurous <laughs> time, but no kids are Those allowed kids to do anymore. Those kids turned out fine. <laughs> yeah, just one of them kind of, Was you know, the Demi Gorgon well, on yes. the sex offender list? <laughs> I think almost certainly. Did you see that weird pedal face it had? It must have been. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, he's kept got, stealing children. He had a, he had a weird goodness. mustache if you look real close. <laughs> but that talk, I'm sure, challenged some of our members. You know, yeah. I'm sure that it prevent, presented a view they hadn't heard before and that made them uncomfortable on an emotional level. And sometimes we have some of our members and visitors approach myself or Kate Lovelady, who's the other, the senior leader at the Ethical Society. She's been there for more than 10 years. She's amazing. And say, I didn't like what the person said on Sunday. It really made me uncomfortable. And my response to that is, good, good. Because unless we're making you uncomfortable sometimes about your beliefs, we're not challenging you to change your mind. We're not challenging you to at least think. You don't have to agree with what was said. You don't have to, ever. But it's good for you to think about something that makes you uncomfortable so that you can at least defend your own position better if you're going to hold to it. See, and the same thing would happen a lot in church where somebody would feel uncomfortable with it and it would be like an emotional response. But because it was so tied into so much dogma and black mm -hmm. and white thinking that it's like, well, I feel uncomfortable about this. So what you're doing is ungodly and what you're doing is wrong and it's against the Bible and you need to, you know, and so it kind of like takes an extra charge and kind right, of blows yeah, it up Right, yeah, it really powers, yeah. Yeah, I was actually reading, there was a study recently that uh, that sort of showed that when you're, not even a study, this is like, I think this is pretty established in the scientific community, that your amygdala is activated when idea, your ideas are challenged. Yes. Not just, like literally, you become, your body is designed to become defensive in an aggressive... What's amygdala? Amygdala is the, the uh, aggression center of your brain. Right? I was asking for everybody else. I mean, I knew, obviously, <laughs> but some right. of our listeners aren't as right. educated as us, you know? Right, right. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I didn't know what so, it was. <laughs> so literally, yeah, no, you're doing great, Brady. Thanks. So literally, you're be, you're becoming, you respond to, like if somebody, you know, threatened you or came up to you and threw a punch, your body responds the same way when your ideas are challenged as it does when you're you're being physically threatened. Mm. So, uh, you, so having that sort of like dogmatic black and white, 
this is right, this is wrong, this has to be a certain way, just, yeah, totally reinforces that and just, it charges that so much more. It's really... Wow. And that, what you've just done, that little description of the amygdala and how it affects our responses to our ideas being challenged, that could be part of a platform on a Sunday morning. We talk right, about that right. stuff because we believe understanding the sort of animal that we are is really important to making better decisions. Mm, yeah. Even we can't control the reactions of our amygdala, right? That's one of the features of it. It's very, very difficult to kind of exert conscious control over it. But again, we can understand, oh, I'm reacting like this partly because I feel threatened by this new information and my body is interpreting it as a physical threat. And so, you know, my heart's racing now. Knowing that can help people have a bit more control over themselves. I'm actually really excited about our next year of programs at the Ethical Society because it is all on the theme of the emotions. And every month we're exploring a different emotion. And one of my ideas was to have a platform each month where we try and design it to make people feel the emotion during the morning. So we have fear month and we're going to make them feel fear. And we have curiosity month and we're going to make them feel curiosity and we have lust month and that's going to be my fave <laughs> oh my god i love it lust oh so we were talking earlier about uh community like creating communities and everything did you have any advice that you'd like to give our our listeners of like what to look for how to find a community how to create one what what needs to be what is the basic common thing that needs to be there for there to be a community That is a huge question. Firstly, I think that it's a a good question in general because I think a lot of people are searching for community spaces which fulfill some of the roles of religious congregation. I hear in many of your podcasts that people who have left their religious background miss some aspects of their religious past sometimes. And often it's associated with the community they're a part of, which even though it sounds like from many of your experiences and the experiences of your guests was often traumatic and abusive, was sometimes also affirming and powerful. And people often, I find in our members, they want the sense of being part of something bigger than themselves. They want to feel like They are making deep connections with other people that mean something. They want to be visited in hospital and they want someone to care when they're sick and not doing so well or to ask them how they're doing or to hang out with. And so I think a lot of people are looking for community and the way that we approach it is to try and build the community around these shared values, right? We don't have the dogma, we don't have the scripture, we don't have a teacher, we have values. And they're interpreted differently by different people, but we consciously try and return people to those core values as the central organizing principle of our community. Because I do believe you need to build a community around something. Mm-hmm. People have to have something right. in common. Yeah. That they're kind of circling and, and gets people together. And so, for example, this morning I did a short announcement, I guess, a, a short little talk note on what had happened in Charlottesville over the weekend because it's made national news. It's obviously extremely disturbing to see neo Nazis and white supremacists walking with torches through a college campus and someone ki- was killed with this act of terrorism with the car driving into counter protesters and this sort of thing is increasingly common in the united states and obviously we want to speak about the ethical implications of things like this happening and i see those opportunities to speak to topical issues as a way of reminding people why we're there because one of my worries and i think that every congregation probably struggles with this is what one of my concerns would be that we become just a place where people hang out and have coffee together. And that's not why we exist. Mm -hmm. We exist to engage people in discussion and thought around how to treat each other and to hopefully improve society through improving our members and their ethical decision-making and the, and to make our members as exemplary human beings as we can. And I like to use a Sunday morning as a way to remind people that's why we are there, that there is a purpose behind community beyond the community. And it's funny because I listen to your podcasts and I feel like a lot of the things I say, like any Christian minister would say, like Mm -hmm. my approach to it is so similar. It's one of the reasons I find a lot of kinship with other clergy in the city is because 
I think we're engaged in many of the same things and look at it from the same perspective. That's beautiful. Um, you keep saying that. I'm blushing. We have two. <laughs> we have two options. It's your shirt. It's really making this whole thing. Good shirt. My triangular pectorals. <laughs> so the things that you talked about in in your your platform this morning, um, I think, are very important. I'm hoping that a lot of churches are doing the same thing. Um, I feel like historically, when it comes to big situations, especially with um, our political environment, which I don't want to get into too much for my own mental health. Um, but it seems that a lot of these things are being ignored from the pulpits at churches. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that you are speaking on them and I'm hoping that other people are as well and, and, and directly condemning certain behaviors, um, and, and belief systems and white supremacy and all of that. Um, but I, I definitely do see a difference between, your responses to a lot of things um, on social media when it comes to um, these big events that are happening, you flat out say this is wrong. Um, and I'm still friends with a lot of Christian leaders, and um, there's a lot of times silence. Mm-hmm. I see a contrast in how you handle things and how they handle things. Uh, we need to take a short break. When we get back, I do want to finally tackle um, kind of like at least a story about how your response has been very different than other clergy people. Um, and also, did you go to a passion play this weekend? I did. I have to hear about what you feel about that. Uh, where was it? <laughs> it was actually earlier this week, and it was in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. It oh. was the great passion play. The, the, the heartbeat of, of uh, the Bible Belt. It Arkansas. was not really. It's kind of a. It's kind of like a gay community, isn't it? Like a that weird like pocket. Is a of, weird oh, pocket okay. Of no, I had no idea. Very, very gay friendly kind of art town, and it's also super religious. Christian it's the Austin, town. Texas of Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> when we get back, we'll hear about that. Extra, extra. Read all about it. Why are you trying to sell a newspaper on our podcast? I'm not. I'm telling our listeners about the blog. Did you know that the podcast is only one of the themes that we produce? Yes. We also have a blog on thelifeafter.org, posts about starting over after religious trauma. But don't you think you're being a little extra? I am extra. And you can read all about it on thelifeafter.org. But um bum James Weaven, I've been promising this for the entire episode that we were going to talk about the Clash of the Titans. Uh, I want to hear about um, some royal rumbles you've had with Christian leaders. I'm so kidding on this. This is not my tone. In whatsoever. this corner, <laughs> yeah, the humanist, James Croft, standing at two Boom. meters. Wait, I don't know. Two like, meters. How, how much tall is are people? Like me? I don't know. I don't know feet. You're, there, I think you'd be about six foot five. Are you six five? I am not remotely okay. six five. Wait, how many meters is that? <laughs> I was trying to make a British joke because I've been in metrics. America for uh, ten years. I wouldn't be able to tell you my own height in meters. Okay. Okay. So tell us. <laughs> Tell us about um because you, you you get on these panels and these yes. committees of clergy people. Yes. And you're usually the only one who really is religious. Is that fair to say? <laughs> religious in the sense of having like a dogma or a a very Give me some words here, because I'm using the wrong words. <laughs> well, I don't know what you mean to say, so... Well, I mean, like, a lot of times... So you're on there as a humanist, who, yes. and you identify as an atheist. Yes. Okay. But I am an on, atheist. Um, but you are going to be on the same panels as people who are uh, Catholic clergymen, yes. Yes. or Lutheran, or Baptist, or whatever. I am usually... I'm almost always the only humanist. I'm usually the only person who doesn't believe in God. And... That does add a little difference to how we approach issues. Like even very progressive clergy people, in my experience, and I should say, I have had the extraordinary privilege over the past three years, particularly since getting involved in the Ferguson uprising and everything that's followed, mm. to work alongside extraordinarily principled, courageous clergy people. And that's I awesome. have enormous respect for many of the clergy people in this town who I know and have worked beside, who have risked an awful lot, their physical health, their career, uh, have put enormous amount of time into the movement for black lives, because that has been astonishing for me. I moved to St. Louis in June of 2014. Mike Brown was shot in August of 2014. Mm -hmm. So it was the first thing that I did when I moved to St. Louis to begin working at the Ethical Society 
was to get involved with the movement for black lives. And really my first year here was dominated by that street protests and jail support and attempts to reform criminal justice. And a lot of the organizing that I was involved with during that time was done through Christian churches. That's huge. Yeah. Jewish temples, you know, mm-hmm. a, a lot of amazing clergy people involved in that effort, extremely brave people. So I am not someone who hates religion. I think that's actually a silly thing to say. I think that religion is too complex and broad a phenomenon to be declared good or bad in total. I think you have to kind of pick it apart and analyze it bit by bit. And I am certainly not someone who thinks that all traditionally religious people or clergy people are bad people. That's just totally not what I believe. So the common themes that you have in your community with these other people are a care for others, yes. Black Lives Matters, other things. So it's like we are able to team up with Christians where there is an overlap. There. Oh, yeah. And often there is. Like wherever a clergy person sees their role as using the resources of their religious tradition or seeing in the resources of their religious tradition an affirmation of the dignity and worth of people, mm. then we are going to be on the same That's side. Huge. Absolutely. Because they see in their scripture a call to arms to defend the defenseless and to uplift the downtrodden and all that good stuff. And I can totally get with that. And some of my most inspiring moments in life have come over the past three years, you know, sitting on some of these panels or being, I was asked to represent the Ethical Society and Humanism at this huge event after Ferguson in Chafetz Arena. And Ooh. yeah, um, Cornell West was there. Right. Oh, wow. And I was speaking mm. and it was just very strange. It's unusual that humanists get involved in these big events because usually it's kind of, you have a bunch of different types of Christians, a Jewish person, and maybe if they can find a Muslim, you know, that's, right, right, right. that's what they usually are. But because we had been working together for so long and been on the, in the streets together and mm, doing a mm-hmm. lot of protesting together, they really did uh, see the Ethical Society as part of the picture and they worked really cool. hard to involve us in awesome. that stuff. So that is amazing when you find those overlaps in values despite really quite different belief systems. Mm-hmm. That's very inspiring. I rem- and sometimes the difference in beliefs does come up, you know? It's not like not part of the equation. It's not like we don't talk about it. I remember once before shutting down some streets in Clayton when <laughs> I, I'm sad to laugh because it was it just amuses me in hindsight, but at the time it was a bit tense, but... We were doing a sort of kind of pseudo prayer circle, pseudo kind of, this is why we're here this morning. This is our call to justice. And each person was saying a little bit of thing about what had happened. And I believe it was the day after the police gassed Mokabees. I don't know if you remember, but your listeners might not know. That was crazy. Yeah. So so there's a bunch of protesters. Wait, sorry. Just to put put this in perspective, Mokabees is a a progressive, very LGBTQIA plus um, very Black Lives Matter pro community coffee shop. Yes. It's a coffee it's shop. It's a coffee Here's shop. Lives, right? and, and it, for one night at the height of the protests in that particular area, it was designated along with some other, some congregations in town. It was the only one that wasn't a congregation as a sanctuary space. And we had decided that this was a space where protesters could go to, uh, hang out with each other and get away from the street protesting if it got too dangerous or they needed a break, get some coffee and stuff like that. And there was Center Reform Congregation, the Jewish congregation near where I live in the Central West End. And there was another church somewhere else that was a sanctuary space. And there was Mokavis, which was the only kind of secular sanctuary space. And a bunch of activists were gathered in there in the evening after a lot of street protests mm-hmm. had been dispersed And the police fired tear gas canisters into the building. Mm -hmm. And my friends are in there and they were tweeting it, live tweeting it, sending photos of the gas just filling this this building. And it was extremely dangerous and totally illegal. The uh, Amnesty International actually did a report later which cited that as a illegal violation of people's civil liberties. Well, it was yeah. an astonishing it thing was, to yeah, happen. I mean, it was outrageous. It was ridiculous. I'm, it was, I, hmm. I feel like this protest that we were doing on the streets of Clayton, which is a swanky part of St. Louis, swanky little suburb. I'm not going to say what I think about Clayton. It's not my favorite place to go. 
We were gathering before this, shutting down some streets as a bunch of clergy people. We had our clergy vests on. We would wear these luminous orange clergy vests, and I had real ambivalent feelings about it, but I wore it when they asked me to wear it. <laughs> right. And we were talking about why we were there, and people were saying, oh, they feel the spirit of God in this and all this stuff. And it came to my turn, and I was like, I just saw a bunch of my friends get gassed by their own government. I've seen tanks, you know, driving around the streets. People are getting beat up, you know, people are being dragged from their wheelchairs and arrested for peaceful protesting. I don't see any evidence of any sort of just God at all. Mm. I just see enormous human injustice and other human beings who are brave enough to stand against it. And mm. that's why I'm here. And someone burst into tears and had a crisis of faith oh. right there. Like a Christian person, she burst into tears and she was like, I don't see God either. Oh. And I was like, oh, oh no, wow. what have I done? <laughs> and so some. Sometimes the difference in belief really does come into play when you're in these intense moments where you're explaining your moral foundations and what drives you to be active for justice in the world. But we could still work together. Like we got over it. We we got onto the streets. We shut down some streets in Clayton. We did a die-in. We had a prayer moment where everyone kneeled down except me. There's a really good photo of all the clergy kneeling and I'm just kind of standing there because we don't pray in you know, I don't, I don't participate in things that I, I don't, it's not that I was criticizing them praying. It's that mm -hmm. I don't do it and it's not uh, authentic for me to do. So that's not how we, we live out our life stance. But uh, so sometimes it comes into play like that. And other times there's just direct conflict where people's interpretation of their religion, it seems to me, denigrates human beings and their dignity. And then we have to say in the ethical society, I, I am perfectly happy to say we think you're wrong. We think your religious teaching is wrong. And we oppose that. And we've had some fun in that arena too. Um, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, we do need to go here in a minute. But before we do, can you tell us about this passion play? Because I'm always interested in like, what does this stuff right. look like from the lens of from somebody outside, who didn't grow up right, with it? Right. And, and you've hung out with some of us from the life yes. after. It's and you've so heard some of our weird stories of mm -hmm. like what we grew up in. And as somebody who didn't experience that, um, what was this passion play like? What was your feelings with well, it? Well, first, I, I want to say that I do not know here I am to worship, which is <laughs> get not, off not the show now. No. <laughs> I am not a Christian, so your friend was right. Like, <laughs> that's true. I have found this whole podcast fascinating listening to it because there are so many in-group references that I don't get having never been a Christian and not being an American. Because mm -hmm. I think a lot mm -hmm. of what you're describing is particular to American Christianity, particular forms of American Christianity. But I wanted to see the great passion play in Eureka Springs, Arkansas, because it is kind of legendary as I think one of the biggest open air theatrical productions in America. It's you know, thousands upon thousands of people have seen it over the many decades it's been shown. And I find it fascinating as part of the culture I live in now to understand it more deeply, what people believe and how they express that. And I was a theater kid all through middle school and high school, all through college. I have always loved theater and performed in theater, and I wasn't going to pass up an opportunity to see a huge theatrical production. It was fascinating. I mean, I can't, so many layers. Firstly, they had a herd of cattle that little children like chased out of the wings and across the stage. Like if you imagine the stage, it's this huge open air amphitheater. And then there's this area of like open area of like sandy ground, which is like the marketplace in Jerusalem, I guess. Uh -huh. And then uh, around it, they have all the different places that are important to the passion story. So they have, the temple, uh -huh. and they have the place where the Sanhedrin gather to talk about mm -hmm. Jesus, and they have Pontius Pilate's palace, and they had um, the place where Herod hung out, and these are all kind of arrayed uh, as a backdrop, but they're all like real kind of buildings, like almost whole mm -hmm. buildings built there. And then above them is the Garden of Gethsemane and Golgotha, and the whole deal, and, and people can go out out the, these big doors and up the back mm -hmm. onto the hills and then they're above the rest of the stage and they're doing all that stuff up there. And it, production values were great. Like yeah. they had this system of lighting and a sound system unique to each area of the stage so that whenever they moved from the temple to Herod's palace, the, the lighting went down the temple, it went up in Herod's palace uh -huh, uh -huh. and then you could um, 
hear the sound coming out from there. And so that was great. And then the Centurions rode in on their horses, <laughs> looking super gay. But, you know, like, <laughs> like rode in their horses with their whole regalia. They had, as I said, this, regalia. this bunch of cattle that kind of yeah, these yeah. kids would just chase. And they used it three times because they're like, we trained these cattle. We're going to get the most use out of it. Christians love doing things It was threes. so weird. Yeah. And then when... Jesus uh, turned over the tables in the temple, which is really my favorite part of the whole story. He flips over this one table and all these doves come flying out, like tens of doves and fly oh, around. Too. And there were maybe like a hundred actors on stage sometimes wow. for this thing. It was quite impressive from that aspect. But the thing that made me laugh the most and that really just... None of the actors delivered any of their lines live. It's all pre-recorded with a soundtrack and they mouth and gesture along with it. And so the whole thing, all I could think of is like, it's a huge drag race. The whole thing is a massive (laughs) drag act. And then the the best thing was they- Did you you get your your fives and tens out? They they had to- (laughs) They had to indicate who was speaking by gesturing like a lot. It was like had to be overdone. And so the best part, like, and it was so tragic that this was this was the best part, was when the the thieves and Christ were all on the cross and they mm-hmm. had erected you know life side cross some real people up on them. When the thieves were speaking to Christ, obviously they couldn't like gesture and and indicate very easily that they were the ones speaking. And so like, so, so they, they, the way they solved this problem was like, they were hanging on the cross, but they sort of wiggled their torsos up and down when it was their turn to speak and kind of waggled their jaws. So you had these kind of, kind of like gyrating figures hanging from crosses. And then if you imagine every accent recorded for every actor in this production was Heavy Arkansas. Okay. Like, so okay. It was all these 100%, 100% white actors performing these lines, and and they and none of them, I have to say, were actually good. Like this is the the music was great, the lighting was great, the sound system was great, the stage was great, the animals were great, and then the delivery of the lines was <laughs> like so bad. It was like it was Father, why have you forsaken me? <laughs> And it was like, oh my, <laughs> this is no, so. No. Yeah, uh, this is... but the whole thing was extra. Like when, <laughs> when, extra. The, when Jesus is in the tomb and he's literally fighting the devil, who appears as a super swishy guy a couple of times. He kind of waves his arms around and then goes out. <laughs> When he's in the tomb fighting, the light comes from the tomb and there's thunder and there's like a green light coming from it. And then at the pivotal moment when Jesus wins, like this angel appears on top and they suddenly light it. But it kind of it kind of snaps into position with this sort of jazz hands and the the wings sort of flutter a bit. And the whole thing is like, I, I have to say, I went with a friend who I made in a friend who I knew from. Uh, before and a friend I made while I was in Eureka Springs and he was a great guy another gay guy so three gay guys going and he was so high he told me at the beginning of this thing he's like okay to get through this I'm so high right now I just have to say I'm so high right now yeah. and he when that angel snapped like ba ba he just burst into the worst <laughs> giggles and I was like he's defeating death right now you can't laugh this is really important to people <laughs> And I, I honestly was not there to mock or judge it. And some parts that I found really, really good, but some of it was just so silly. Like yeah. when, when Peter denied him three times and then finally he realizes what he's done, he like collapses at this little well in the middle of the stage and starts whipping the water with this like bag of money. And, and this recorded voice booms all over different parts of the stage. Guilty, 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 guilty. And it was just like, no. Fantastic. No, if you're going to believe this stuff, treat it well. Like, treat the material mm. well. It can be a profoundly engaging story. Mm-hmm. It's not the best story ever told. People say it's not. It's Everyone knows the ending. But it can still be a moving and psychologically interesting story if you treat it with respect. And some of it was just too simplistic. That made my day. That was beautiful. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Um, to our uh, listeners. I Dr. Wanna... James Croft. 
<laughs> dual wielding pistols. Mm-hmm. A triangular uh, p- pectoral. Pistols, <laughs> pistols of pistols of reason. My polygonal pecs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Work. I want to thank you so much for joining us on the show today, James. Um, that was amazing. Uh, listeners, thank you for holding on to us for this extra long episode. I think you understand why we needed it to be a little extra long. It was so worth it. Uh, this is Brady Harden. I'm here with... Chuck Parson. This has been a life after. Remember, if you don't go to church, Sunday is just a second Saturday. We'll see you next time.